Okay, so today we're covering Lab 21. Uh, it's a pretty long lecture, so we break it up into uh, three parts. And so what you need to keep in mind when we're doing this is don't get overwhelmed or don't feel overwhelmed. Just keep in mind the structure, location, and function. Basically, where is it? What is it? How does it work? You know, try to keep it under... You should be able to give one sentence, two sentence definitions for all these things in terms of function. Again, just don't get too overwhelmed by anything. All right, and so like I said, we're going to cover three parts today. Part one is going to cover some basic terminology, uh, some of the gross anatomy structures, and then two specific structures within it, the meninges and the ventricles. Part two is going to get into some of the lobes and other internal structures, and then part three deals with the cranial nerves. So just like in chapter two when you had to learn uh, anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, superficial, deep, uh, there are specific directional terms that are associated with the brain. All right? So rostral means anterior, towards the front. Caudal is like a tail. It means towards the back or posterior. So rostral is anterior, caudal is posterior. The main meat of the brain is called the cere cerebrum. Right? This composes almost 85% uh, of the actual brain volume. The other two parts are the brainstem and the cerebellum. The brainstem is shown in green, the cerebellum in blue. Cerebellum, uh, really, it, it's a very small portion of the brain, but it contains up to about 50% of the neurons. And that's because a lot of the motor coordination, or a lot of motor coordination occurs in this area, occurs within this uh, cerebellum. Some other main structures that we want you to know. When you look at the overall kind of structure of a brain, you are looking at mostly the cerebral cortex. It's the top three millimeters uh, of the brain. And this is composed of mostly a, of gray matter. And so gray matter, the way to think about that is that it's the computer. So this is the action sites of the brain. This is where most of the activity occurs. And then you have white matter which are basically myelinated axons that act as cables between the computers and other structures to transmit information. Uh, and so, again, the myelination, you really don't need to be too concerned with it. It's just kind of, imagine it as insulation for cables. It's really keeping the electrical signals passed, that are passed along kind of running smoothly and pretty focused along those, uh, those pathways. So again, the cerebral cortex is made up mostly of gray matter or of the computers. And within that cortex, you have what are called convolutions. And the convolutions are those folds within the brain. And so again, you know, whenever you see folds, basically you're increasing the surface area, right? So it's the same idea as a microvilli. If you guys remember uh, way back to lab six when we started, we were talking about do you guys remember the epithelial tissue, right? That simple columnar has that epithelial or has that microvilli on it. All right, so same sort of context here uh, with the cerebral cortex. All these folds are increasing surface area. And the convolutions or these folds uh, are composed of both ridges and depressions. And the ridges are a special name. Gyri are the plural, or gyrus is singular, and then sulci or sulcus are the depressions. Um, sometimes you see them called fissures, um, but uh, they're used pretty interchangeably. All right, so the convolutions, the uh, which are made up of gyri and sulci, kind of, which then form the cerebral cortex. And if you look at the brain, this kind of superior view. Uh, looking down on it is you see two halves or two hemispheres. You have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere and along the middle you see a very long line or uh, depression or fissure and this is the longitudinal fissure which effectively separates the two hemispheres. Alright, so we've talked about some of these general structures around the brain and now we're going to get into some of the specific structures 
uh, that help support it. And the first one we're going to talk about is the meninges, which is composed up of three layers. The dura mater, the arachnoid matter, and the pia mater. And so the dura mater, which is basically dense connective tissue, uh, is actually composed of two individual layers as well, uh, further I guess. It's the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. The periosteal is going to be superficial to the meningeal. And, and so you actually can see the dura mater surrounding the brain stem when you do the sheep dissection and the sheep brain dissection. And it kind of looks as this really kind of plasticky, opaque look to it and feel to it. It's tough. Uh, it's really kind of this outer, outmost uh, protective layer. If you go one layer deeper you get into the arachnoid matter and itself is a thin membrane but the subarachnoid space that it creates between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter is where the CSF is and it has the arachnoid as you might guess from that word uh, it's very spidery or web-like in its structure All right, so that subarachnoid space in particular has this web-like um, structure among it that allows the CSF to pass through and so CSF is cerebral spinal fluid, and we'll talk about that in the next couple slides. The deepest layer is the pia mater, and this is going to be the one that's going to directly cover the brain, basically acting like saran wrap or, you know, in the sense that it is shrink wrapped around the brain very tightly. It's another one you can actually see on the sheep brain, it kind of pick at it. Uh, when you're making these cuts, you actually see, you can feel this thin film over, and that's the pia matter. And if you remember that the meninges uh, are, we, we kind of, you, the last time we saw that term pop up is when we were talking about the distinction, be, or distinguishing between cranial and facial bones, right? So cranial bones are going to be the ones that are in direct contact with the meninges, and the facial bones are going to be the ones that are not. Here's a coronal cut of the cranial meninges showing uh, kind of a, a section where we're looking probably anterior. And you can see the dura mater with the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer that, are, that it's composed of. And you can go down a little bit deeper and see the arachnoid, um, the arachnoid matter and the arachnoid villi uh, that kind of compose that subarachnoid space where the CSF fluid is passed through. And then you can see that in the purple, the pia matter. So meningitis is going to be, it can be bacterial, it can be fungal, it can be a viral infection of the meninges. And so it basically typically enters the brain or enters the area through the choroid plexus, which is a structure that CSF uh, is um, created and secreted into the brain. And it's interesting when you think about an infection of meninges or what an infection is or what kind of the, the symptoms that are associated with it. But basically when you have an infection, it's going to lead to inflammation. So more your body's trying to fight this infection. So it's going to pump fluids into the, the, that whatever specific area. In this case, it's the surrounding of the brain and leading to inflammation. However, since this area is kind of this packed shell, right, you can't really expand. It's not going to swell. The only place for it to swell is in on itself. So you lead to this inflammation of the brain, right? So the swelling of the brain. And the blood-brain barrier, which is this kind of filter that allows things in and out, can't really function properly. And so it becomes overwhelmed, and so you have this chronic inflammation and basically all this pressure on your brain cells, and it leads to death or apoptosis in the sense that these cells are not used to this pressure and then leads to cell death and without treatment, basically death effectively. And so it's kind of a big deal. And you see it pop up in areas where people kind of live in con are living together for the first time in high densities. So college campuses is a really kind of characteristic example of that we had a scare at NAU last year and a couple of years ago. And so it's kind of a big deal um, in terms of treatment because mainly because the it's fatal of the severity of it all right so we've talked about the meninges and other main structures that we're going to talk about are the ventricles and these are associated because they are 
producing the CSF or that cerebrospinal fluid that basically travels throughout the entire uh, central nervous system and passing through that arachnoid, uh, arachnoid villa until it gets reabsorbed, right? So it's actually existing within the meninges. All right, here's a diagram showing an anterior and a lateral view of the ventricles. And so this, I kind of think, looks like the, you know, the Starship Enterprise uh, or some sort of spaceship. The, ventri the ventricles make up some sort of spaceship that exists within the brain. And you have a, what I call the left lateral ventricle, the right lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle. And again, these are all dealing with the production of CSF. And you can see between the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle, that's what's called the cerebral aqueduct, right? And if you remember what an aqueduct is, it's just a little passageway that allows fluid to go through. And usually you see it in terms of water in cities um, back in the um, Roman times. But uh, here it's obviously referencing the connection between the ventricles, sort of the flow of CSF. And CSF itself is basically this clear fluid that the brain produces um, basically a half liter every day. And it's getting produced and absorbed. And it's really dealing with uh, maintaining a neutrally buoyant and chemically stable environment, right? So in all sense of the word, it's kind of offering protection for the brain. So kind of making sure that waste, uh, waste products are moved away uh, and that it doesn't, brain doesn't slosh and hit against the side of your skull. And so the way um, the specific structure within the ventricle that's producing this is called the choroid plexus, um, or in Greek or, uh, or Latin, the delicate knot. And so that's the specific site of CSF production. And you'll be able to see this when we do the dissections. Um, and, you know, a way to think about the functions of CSF is with a hangover, right? So you've had one or you've heard of one. A uh, hangover comes when you drink too much alcohol, and the next morning you wake up with this pounding headache. And one of the reasons that's causing that uh, headache is this lack um, of, or this difficulty in producing CSF. So alcohol itself is a diuretic and makes you go pee a lot. So you become dehydrated. When you become dehydrated, your body really struggles to produce CSF. And you imagine, you see that turnover of... 500 mLs a day of CSF, and your body's really, um, if you don't have enough fluids there, it's really struggling to produce that CSF. And when you're not able to produce it, you're basically, those wastes are staying, those waste products are sitting on your brain longer. Every time you turn over in your sleep, your brain is kind of hitting against the side of this, your skull, and so you kind of don't have the, the balance. So you need to make sure that if you choose to drink, that you hydrate properly. So you drink water constantly. You're drinking uh, Gatorade or whatever to help maintain the electrolytes and all the kind of important properties that go into CSF, the production of CSF. Here's a schematic showing the general flow. If you look at, again, this is a lateral view. If you can see through one, uh, two, and three, you have Basically, the th the first three ventricles, the left and right uh, lateral ventricle. In this case, it would be the right ventricle. Uh, three is the third ventricle, and you can kind of see those wavy structures are all the choroid plexus. It passed through four, which is kind of the cerebral aqueduct, to the fourth ventricle, which is located just uh, deep to the cerebellum. And then when you look to seven or eight, you're dealing with uh, a distribution and then reabsorption through the subarachnoid space, and right? so that arachnoid villa. Uh, a, a disease that you see with the ventricles is um, hydrocephaly, and that person's head is swollen because if you remember that the cranial bones haven't quite fused yet uh, when you um, are born or when you're young, and so you're still your brain's still developing. So what's happening here is that you have an overproduction or uh, a blockage of drainage for the CSF fluid. And so if you're dealing with CSF fluid, um, 
basically what's happening is it's very similar to meningitis uh, in the sense that you're putting pressure on the skull and the, the blood-brain barrier and all these things can't really deal with it. So you put pressure in the brain um, leads to cell death. And But you don't really see that too often in first world countries anymore because we have the medical technology to deal with it. And we can watch some videos in class of a shunt, or you can Google it yourself, but basically a shunt being put in that will relieve the pressure and they will run a tube that drains uh, into the stomach and then is passed uh, naturally. Right? So there's ways to deal with it now, deal with the, the either the overproduction or the blockage of CSF. And that's it for part one.